Hello and welcome to Nigeria, the road to 2019, a series of programs where Arise News places the audience and the choice at the heart of our coverage of the upcoming presidential elections. I'm Charles Anyagolu. Coming up in the next 30 minutes, all the news, comment and analysis that provide unrivaled insight into Nigeria 2019, including... It's something of a terrible paradox. Nigeria, a country with tremendous potential, but whose development is held back by a lack of infrastructure such as electricity. How far has the government of President Buhari gone to rectify this anomaly? And should Nigerians be holding the government more to account as the country heads towards the 2019 general election? We talk to the man charged with rebuilding Nigeria's infrastructure. Now, in Nigeria, the quest for infrastructure development seems to be never-ending. The country's massive oil reserves should have been a blessing to be used to build infrastructure and invest in social services. Instead, it's been something of a curse, a lubricant that's produced massive corruption, dysfunctional governments and bad leadership. In 2015, Nigerians, tired of all the wholesale graft, mismanagement and collapsing infrastructure, elected President Buhari on a platform of change. There was a broad plan for the poor, for security and for the economy, and a pledge to tackle corruption as well as restore due process and the rule of law. Though offering very few policy details and being rather vague on how these plans and pledges would be implemented, Nigerians were full of zeal that real dramatic change was coming, and with it would come a better life for all. But after nearly four years in office, critics say Mr. Buhari has failed to breathe new life into the economy. The country is still haunted by high unemployment. The electricity pinch is still as chronic as ever. The roads are still broken. Poverty is deepening and cobwebs brush against the faces of those who visit the great factories that once made cities like Kano in the northwest and Aba in the southeast great commercial hubs. So, as Nigeria heads towards the 2019 general election and the country takes stock, questions are being asked about what has happened to the promised change and why the winds of transformation appear to have turned. Well, let's talk to the man charged with rebuilding Nigeria's crumbling infrastructure and whose success in this critical area would boost President Buhari's chances of re-election tremendously. I'm suitably delighted to welcome the Minister of Power, Works and Housing and former Lagos State Governor Babatunde Raji Fashola, who is also a lawyer and senior advocate of Nigeria, which is the country's equivalent of the Queen's Council in the UK. Thank you very much indeed for coming in. I know you're a busy man, so we appreciate your taking the time to make it into our studios. Now, when you were named as minister, most people thought of you as a very good asset indeed because of your considerable achievements during your tenure as governor of Lagos State. You brought an element of order to what was clearly a chaotic city. There was notable infrastructure development and you gave Lagos something of a facelift. Your party at the time joined the APC coalition and was credited with helping to deliver the massive Lagos votes to President Buhari. Is the mood there now still the same as it was then? I think I would like to start by saying that uh, listening to your introduction, the features of the uh, roads that you have chosen to introduce the program, it's, uh, I ask myself whether I should really be here so that you can run all of the negatives. I think that is important to decide whether you want to see angels or devils. Um, the roads are bad. They haven't, we haven't finished fixing them. But I can say very confidently that uh, in every state of this country now, there is one road project or the other. I've been around them. Some of your studios, some of your colleagues have covered them. And I think that there should be some sense of balance. There has been progress. Uh, people vote for a government for many reasons. And those who voted for roads will tell you that unlike before, there is visible 
deployment of the nation's resources to critical road network. Of course, those roads are very extensive and long roads. They don't get built some in two years or four years. Mm. 560 kilometers, 320 kilometers, 140 kilometers, or four, five, six, in some cases, ten lanes. And that's just man hour by man hour. As far as power is concerned, I think those who consume the energy will tell you, contrary to the intro, that their circumstances have somewhat improved. Is it going to be a silver bullet? No. There is no big bank theory to solving a nation's problems. But I think that if you look at the nation's economic recovery and growth plan, because you said also that our promises were not clear, there are not enough platforms to engage rudimentary focused debates in elections. And I'm happy that you have created such a platform. Mm. And I hope that you will use it to inform and educate voters. Nigeria are at a very interesting point, very interesting uh, uh, juncture in our democratic process. It was once thought that an incumbent could never be defeated. That has happened. Nigerians have now voted for two parties, two of the dominant parties. So we now stand where the Europeans, many Europeans and the Americans stand. The question now is how much time does the government need to take us to El Dorado? Is right. it three years? Will change come in three years or will it come in a decade? Which are the countries that have achieved change, radical change, in three years? It is usually often a decade of action, sometimes almost a generation of action. But in choosing whether or not to allow those in government continue or to leave is what are the critical signs that you see that makes yesterday different from today. And you will see those critical signs in deployment of road work, recommencement of roads that have stopped for almost a decade. Right. I, I'm going to have to jump in there. Um, but let's talk about power. I don't know if you've seen today's newspapers, um, the, the This Day newspaper leading with latest reports that suggest the country has lost more than 3,000 megawatts of electricity uh, because six gas-fired power plants, not one, not two, six, have not been able to generate power. So in a country of nearly 200 million people at present, you're only able to generate 300 meg 3,000 megawatts. So no change really in power from previous governments. Now, that is your conclusion. Well, I'm, I'm and simply us, quoting what, look, what, what is in the papers today. I think today. it is important first to then tell Nigerians what was the reason for the reportage. Because the reason was gas supply. And gas is fuel. And fuel supply can be hampered from time to time. As you and I speak, there are power plant outages for maintenance, for damage, there are mechanical and electrical processes. They go out in the richest nations in the world. I can tell you that for nothing. What they have is a reserve to fall on, and that is where we are different. But with specific reference to that report, I get the daily discharge, uh, uh, the daily report of power supply in the last 24 hours. Mm. As at yesterday, the report that I got was that we put at peak demand 4,600 and. 46 megawatt of power on the grid yesterday at peak demand. Now, the day before, it was 4,400. So actually, between the last two days, the report from the National Control Center was an increase rather than a decrease. Well, that's not what if, we're If here. you allow me to, if you allow right. me to, you've put numbers at me. So let me respond. Yeah. Now, those are the numbers I have from the National Control Center. I get them on a daily basis with breakdown of which power plant did what. Mm. And those numbers are shared with the highest levels of government. So they're not numbers I control. They're numbers that are fed back to all of us in government. Now, if there is an outage because there's a gas shortage, there are outages for so many other reasons. Right. Not the least of which sometimes includes um, a transmission failures or distribution failures. There are problems, there are snags that we will correct. Mm -hmm. And the ministry does not supply gas. It's another ministry working with private sector who supply gas. So, and I think it's important to tell Nigerians what is the cause. They are not permanent setbacks. They are setbacks on our journey that we overcome. Two years ago, we had gas outages across the Niger Delta. Power plunged to about 3,000 megawatts. That wasn't because there were no power plants to generate. It was because that the gas lines had been sabotaged. We recovered them, and we are back. Right. So, let, let's move on from there, and let's talk about the economy.
the growth estimates for Nigeria in 2014, before you came into office, in spite of the dramatic drop in oil prices at the time, um, which was between 50 and $55 a barrel, that's where it dropped to, was still 6.2%. That was the growth estimate for the Nigerian economy. But soon after your government took over, everything slowed down. According to the excoriating criticism that followed, um, you became, I mean, the, the president was essentially as slow as somebody described it as earthworms in taking any decision. There was no cabinet for nearly seven months, for example, and the country is still paying the price for that. Okay, let's quickly feedback. Government was elected 29th of May. Cabinet was constituted on the 11th of June. 11th of November. That wasn't seven months. I'm that was, that wasn't seven months. Let seven me respond now. Six Let months. me respond now. That wasn't seven months. If you have run government before, as I have, you will look at what the president set out to do first. He wanted to reduce the number of ministers. You don't reduce what you don't know. There were 42 ministers. Yeah, but he should have done that before do he you came want me into to respond? No, 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 I understand you that. You want me to respond, but, but he should have, this, It's not a monologue. So let me, it's let, a dialogue. Yeah, okay, I mean, he I'm should have done to you. that. Let me yeah, but he should have done that before he came into First office. of all, Charles, you are reading from a script. I'm trying he, he to remember should, all no. what you have said, and I'm trying to respond right, to that. Okay. So let me respond. Now, if you want to ma reduce 42 ministries, the, what I did, which is similar to what he did, was that you meet with the ministry at least a day per minister. That's 42 days. That's one and a half months gone. During that period, he was traveling, trying to contain the crisis in the Northeast, meeting with presidents on a regional mm. basis. During that period, after meeting and taking a brief, you have to reduce it, reconstitute into 24. After that, you have to consult each of the states. He wanted 24, and he said so. But he had to balance national interests. Otherwise, he would have been accused of all sorts of things. But that is neither <laughs> here nor there. When the names were announced, this was the same country that said they did not want ministers to come and take a bow again. The screening took a couple of weeks. So if you factor all of that time to it, you will fairly account for about four months. That is reasonably defensible. But that is not the point. The point also is that you say that the prices of oil drop significantly to... 50 something dollars per barrel. That is not correct. It is correct. The, the, the prices as at, as at early 2015 were in the regions of the 60s to 70s. No, I was talking about Excuse I, me, I, let me, I let said, me respond. No, I listened no. to what you said. I said 2014. Let me li I listened to what you said. The growth estimate 6.2%. You can go back and the play price back, of oil 50 to 55 now, dollars a the, barrel. And the operative word, the operative word right. in your statement is projections. What were the realities? In any event, my answer is simple. If Nigeria was so rosy at the time, why did they vote out the government of the day? That's a good question. If Nigerians were so rosy at the time, why did they vote out the government of the day? This was the same period when there was no power. This was the, and when Buhari came, they said it was the body language that mm. changed the power. This was the period when there were no motorable roads. Construction had literally stopped on virtually all, 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 all road work. Budget for Nigeria's road infrastructure that we inherited was 19 billion naira for all of Nigeria's roads. And they funded only 9 billion or 8 billion naira. Con con converse to what we are doing now. So if we have to make the investment, people must be ready to walk the talk. Right. So that if we invest in infrastructure, it will serve all of us and catalyze the economy. I and when you go your... into that kind of systemic shock, when it then happened that oil prices tumbled to about 40 and below when we took over, it takes time to rebuild back. Yes, but let, let me just say this, because part of the concern was that when you took over, I don't know of many other countries that take almost six to seven months to announce their cabinet. Most cabinets, mo most, most cabinets, you can what hold you, on, what can, I, can I just make the point? No, mo you can most cabinets, what you want to see. most if cabinets, you want to have a discussion, let us have it on mo the fact. Most cabinets, it was not six months no, and mo it was not seven months. Most cabinets hit the ground running. Okay. And what is this and, 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 of and, and, the ground running? Well, what did well, the government well, you're, not you're do? interrupting me. I what? have to make the oh, point. Oh, you interrupted me well, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's look now at Nigeria at the time. Um, it had a budget of roughly six trillion naira. Okay, Nigeria's overall economy 
was worth at the time you came in about 100 trillion naira. The business of government by its own budget of 6 trillion naira is to trigger and attract the rest of the 94 trillion naira into the economy. By holding back for as long as your government did when it came in, by providing no direction or comfort or roadmap, I mean, it took two years before your economic recovery and growth plan came into you know, existence, um, you know, for th those who play with that balance of 94 trillion naira, it was impossible for them to make a move. The assessment, both international and domestic, was that the government, your government, had shortchanged the country and the people by that delay. That's what drove the country into recession. On the contrary, on the contrary, and I think that if you are uh, watching, um, at the time, and this is not unique to Nigeria, these are issues I've addressed before, and these are issues that fair-minded and right-thinking pe people acknowledge. Whenever there is an election, it's a contest in any democracy. Investors hedge, some move, depending on, and that was the election that people had built that it was going to be violent, it was going to be this. So investors had taken different positions, looking for safe haven to watch what was going to happen. And the aftermath of resetting the dynamics, of course, then led other people. And then at the time, government then took a position also. We were losing foreign exchange. We were hemorrhaging. We were using our foreign exchange instead of using it to build our economy. We were using it to defend a currency. At, at, and, and as such, our reserves were diminishing. And government took certain steps and said, look, certain things were no longer valid for foreign exchange at that subsidized rate. That affected some investors, and rightly so. The result now is that instead of importing uh, agro produce with five million, ten million dollars per day. We are producing them locally and creating jobs on the domestic market. Okay, I, I'm going to have to ask you to just take a pause there and catch your breath because uh, my breath is in charge. <laughs> <laughs> we will return in a minute. We are watching Nigeria, the road to 2019. Plenty more still ahead, including more of our chat with the Minister of Power, Works and Housing, and former Lagos State Governor Babatunde Raji Fashola. We return. We turn the focus on the rebellion and the fighting within the APC party and we ask how much might all, might all that hurt the party's chances in 2019. Stay with us. Welcome back to Nigeria, the road to 2019. I'm Charles Anyagolu. Now, as Nigerians continue to assess the fallout from the political rebellion within President Buhari's ruling APC party, there are all kinds of rumours flying around, including suggestions that moves are afoot to neutralise the powerful and rather belligerent breakaway faction known as the reformed APC or RAPC and prevent it from posing a threat to President Buhari's re-election bid in 2019. As you may know, the rebellion launched by the RAPC has come on the back of a tremendous sense of grievance. President Buhari's party appears now to be fertile ground for such insurrections, which are threatening to tear down what was once thought to be a formidable coalition, meticulously built up since 2013. So is the APC leadership listening to the RAPC's catalogue of grievances and offering some form of restitution, or have they effectively disowned the splinter group? Well, we'll be talking about that in a minute, but first we're going to look uh, some more at the Nigerian economy. With me in the studio is President Buhari's Minister of Power, Works and Housing, and former Lagos State Governor Babatunde Raji Fashola. Thank you very much indeed for staying with us. Let's be fair to you and judge your performance against the resources available to you. The government had a budget of just over six trillion naira, correct me if I'm wrong, in 2016, 2017, more than half of which went to recurrent costs. So capital expenditure was hovering around the 2.5 trillion naira mark, out of which about a quarter went to your ministry. You allocated many billions of naira to power projects, things like hydro plants, transmission lines, substations. Several billions went to the National Housing Program and tens of billions went to the construction and rehabilitation of strategic roads. So these are the cash flows. What are the things that you can say you've done with that money? I think the place to start first is to acknowledge that before this government came, 
in the economy that you said was, uh, was projected to do well at 6%, the nation was budgeting only 15% of, of her budget, of her entire budget, to fund capital assets. Well, that's not what let, I let, let, let me Let me make I, the point. I, no, let me I make just the point. Make, I just want to, I I'm sorry to interrupt <laughs> you, but I need to make this point, because I spent quite a bit of time with Ngozi Okonjo-Iwela at the time. She brought recurrent expenditure down to about 65%. I am telling you that every time the budgets were announced, it was 85, 15. They are reported, but that is not the point. That is not, those were the realities. And what was being funded or of that in my own sector was 9 billion of 18 billion. Power was, I think, 10 billion. The, the funding was 5 billion. So that's what we made. And we then decided not only to increase the budget size, but also to ensure that we, pro we moved it to at least 30%. Mm. That was against the massive recurrent costs that we had met workers' salary, running of work, and you needed to trim that down slowly. Otherwise, you would have a capacity uh, issue. Now, in terms of the large sums, I think that the road to the journey that we have undertaken to make Nigeria's business environment competitive, provide infrastructure, will be massively assisted if my ministry and transport ministry were getting no less than a trillion naira over the next right. few years. So you're years. underfunded at the Yes. Moment. It's not enough because we have contract, we've met contractors, mm. contracts in the region of about two trillion that had paid only about 500 billion and everybody is asking for one new road or the other. Mm. And so we just need to continue. And that is why the government has adopted some uh, innovative solutions to funding road projects, like the uh, uh, expansion of the tax credit scheme, like the Sukuk, and lately the, the president's approval that some of the projects in the budget should be funded from some of the funds recovered from the proceeds of crime and so mm. on. So, and also green bonds that we have done to use some of that to fund power interventions if, uh, for the universities. So, there, and no nation has enough money to spend anyway. It's making hard choices and making the choices that are sensible, as this government is doing, in committing to infrastructure and investment that would increase transportation, make power uh, supply more, more, much more available and efficient. And let's also make the point that power sector has been largely privatized. And what government is trying to do is to continue to play its enabling and support role, intervene where it is able to do so, and enable private sector to really go and do the business. So in terms of housing, for example, what we're doing is piloting a model, trying to see whether that model will pass the test of acceptability and, of course, affordability. There are many empty houses in almost every city mm. and state in Certainly Nigeria. Abuja, and, right. and, and they fail those tests. And therefore, instead of rushing out to build what people won't accept, we're piloting models based on extensive studies and, and research that we have done. And we are close now to subjecting that process to the test. Many of those houses have been finished in pilot, and we are now completing the infrastructure, the electrical, the mechanical, mm. the road network, water supply, so that we can appropriately price and see how people respond. This is an expansion of the model that we successfully deployed in Lagos State, where we were producing 200 units every month. And we hope that we can ramp up scale if we achieve this, and then ask private sector to come and take this model over. If you build it, we will buy it because we have tested the model, the public likes it. And in order to support buying, we are looking at how to recapitalize right. Federal Mortgage Bank to be able to be the reserve buyer through mortgages. It all sounds very noble and very laudable. It's but very the, clear the, in my mind well, the, because the, the, we sit down well, to well, articulate it, it, and yeah, plan Yeah, but it, it may be clear in your mind. It's certainly not, be, not clear in the minds of many in And that is why I am here not, and I choose other yeah, platforms they're not, they're not to feeling, continuously explain. Yeah, but the fact is that they're not feeling the effect. The first people who feel the effect on the housing schemes are those who are building it. Go there and you will see right. them. Well, Laborers, suppliers. Right. food vendors, uh, artisans, and small and medium in industries who are supplying the, yeah, the building that, that materials that implies... made in Nigeria right. goods. On the roads, the sections that we have completed, the drivers who are driving over the completed sections will tell you that they are experiencing reduced journey times. I haven't told you we are finished. Somebody told me yesterday at 2 p.m. that I was going to Ibadan. And I said, Ibadan, at 2 p.m. and you are coming. He said, I will come back. The road is better. Just yesterday, and the person got back at 7 p.m. Well, I haven't talked to that person. <laughs> and, and certainly the, the impression... And all you need to do is conduct a survey. Well, the job is I, not I finished. I have driven across Nigeria. The job is not finished. And I can finished. assure you the roads are... Not, that's, that's, that's not in any way denigrating 
the quality of the work that you've done. I'm simply dealing with the facts. And the fact is that the roads are still pretty terrible in many parts of this country. I disagree with now, you. Where did you drive to? Well, I've driven from Abuja to Enugu, for example. Through, if you go through that whole area in Kogi State, the middle of Kogi State, Abuja, uh, around, around, Lokoja, around, Bini, Okene, uh, around, are all under around, construction no, no, around, as we speak. Around, if you go into the areas around Ajokuta, the areas around Geregu, and all that, all of those places are roads. under procurement, or they have recently been awarded. Right. I was in Geregu a couple of months ago to inspect a power plant. Those roads, we inherited them, and they won't be built, as I told you, at the snap of a hand. Right. So they they're not they're not being to, built. They, at present. So they are under contract. Right. And Contractors have moved to site in many of them. Well, the well, governor of Kogi will confirm that to right. The people of Kogi will confirm. I don't, that we're not doubting you. I'm site. simply saying that so, the, the roads, I mean, when I drove through so what there, do you with, want? which is Well, I want the you roads, want to, the be roads to be built overnight. We're already fixing them. Well, what we've seen. We met those roads unfixed. We have started right. fixing them. So what do you want? You want us to be the road so you can <laughs> drive on me? No, I wouldn't want to drive on Precisely. you. Precisely. Because then you wouldn't survive the experience. I wouldn't well, even sur well, surrender myself to be driven right. on. Well, what we've seen... I signed to uh, serve, what not to die. What, what we've seen, absolutely, we, we would rather have you alive. What we've seen for most of the time in office of this administration, I didn't say all the time, most of the time, is negative GDP growth. For the first time in this country in 18 years, starting from the first quarter of 2016, when you were already in power. We've also seen an increase. Those figures just came out recently in unemployment and underemployment. We've seen a big increase in currency pressures. And I'm just wondering, and so are many Nigerians, whether the joke is actually on them, whether they've woken up to find themselves in a nightmare they've chosen and voted into power. The same nightmare they've been living all along, only more frightening this time. Because if you get out on the streets and talk to people, they're going to say to you, things haven't changed. Things have actually got worse. I don't know all of the people you are talking to. I don't pretend that things couldn't be better. There's a lot of scope for improvement. But as I said, you can choose to see devils, I choose to see angels. And as you see those economic numbers, I also see that the interest rate is increasingly coming down from over 18 percent. Now, the employment figures that are being bandied around, and I think that all of, all of us should really sit down and listen to the Bureau of Statistics that, that, that produce those figures. Those are the number of people who are coming into the market, not people who were unemployed as a result of what we did. It just simply means, it doesn't mean that jobs are not being created. It just means that they are not being created at the rate at which we are producing uh, graduates into the market. Right. And every capitalist <coughs> economy, such as ours, the unemployment figures all over, growing all over the world, businesses are shutting you, down you're Europe. You're saying that, that now a lot let of me these make, unemployment me, figures are not as a result of what you've done Not necessarily into so. They are, they, not all of them can be attributed. They are simply attributable to the number of people who are entering universities, for example, number of people who are graduating from skill centers, who are in the market now, they now have skills, and the jobs are not coming that fast. So what we need to do is to ramp up more and do more of what we are doing, increase the budget size, expand infrastructure needs, expand the need for mining, expand the need for supplies, expand agriculture, and people will ultimately, that's why I said this is a dynamic that has changed the trajectory of how this economy is managed, yes. from rent sharing from oil proceeds to an investment in the assets that will build tomorrow's jobs and economy. Yeah, but you, you keep and it's going to about, take time right. to, for that to mature you, into yield. Right. But the critical indices are already beginning to show. You keep talking. Just a minute. The critical right. indices are already beginning to show. Out of a recession, we are back. Growth is back albeit fragile, and we will consolidate to make it stable and yield the well, results. Well, it's extremely fragile because the World Bank's projection You choose is, the is, adjectives. Well, I mean, the World Bank's projection is 0.8% growth. The, you, you're the, saying 2-point something the growth. The World, the World Bank, Bank and the IMF continue to, to not, revise not their projections. But they were worse than this six months ago. They've changed them now. They've revised growth projections, and all of these are projections. Right. Actually, what, what ultimately matters is not what anybody projects, it's what we do. Yeah, but you're making Spend projections. You know that to reflect that the economy what, and create opportunities. Yeah, but what you're saying that this is what you need to do. This is what we are already yeah, doing. You, well, you said that. You said this is what you need to do. I mean, what I'm trying to understand is 
I want to, somebody to take responsibility for the lack of direction from the Buhari administration. Nobody when it, will hold, take hold responsibility for a well, lack well, of well, direction can I make because the there is a direction. Well, can I make the point? When you the take, economic direction of this country no. in the short to medium term is in the economic recovery when, and growth when, plan. When, so nobody yeah, that, will that, take direction no, no, for what on. doesn't exist. What I'm saying is that that economic recovery and growth plan came into existence two years after you came into office. I mean, it took you two years to come up with a plan about how to sort out the Nigerian economy. Hello, sir. And Do you know what growth. it takes to make a plan? No, no, no. Can, can I just... Oh, you think it's just no, all no, this no, talk, can, talk can we I, are planning? Do you know how long about, it takes no, to no, make a plan? What I'm trying if to you say, are serious in what, government... What I am looking at the consequences of that time that it took you to make that plan. This is very because serious business. No, I know it is serious business. That's why I'm talking to you here. agencies to interrelate, requiring arms of government to share the vision. Yes, but, but the, the, the consequence of that... The economic recovery and growth plan had to go through, through parliament, no, no, the, the, through 109 senators, 360 House of Rep members for approval. Do you think that happens overnight? No, what I'm saying is that the consequence of that... Okay, Charles? The, the consequence... <laughs> I'm, listen, <laughs> I'm listening to you. The consequence of that was that many businesses, including international businesses, pulled out of Nigeria. That's a fact. Between that time that you took over and the end of 2016, a lot of businesses pulled out of Nigeria. The banks laid off thousands of workers, okay? In Abuja alone, more than 50... People had been laid you're off you're interrupting me now. Let me finish. companies were already in laying a, off in, people before In Abuja came alone... It was a matter than, of time for no, it to happen. In Abuja In alone, an economy where you are not investing in capital, it was going to happen in, in any Abuja event. Alone, we were losing our reserves. We were using it to defend currency. In, in the a, reserves are now back yeah, because in, we have left the currency to find the market in, in Abuja to operate alone, on on more than 50,000 workers were let go in the first year and a half of your government. I mean, let's I face it. I don't know it, where you got no, those numbers no, from. Th th those numbers are available. Uh, from where? F from a who, macro... Who, who the banks, the the banks supply their no, numbers. No, no, no. I don't, I don't have from, those numbers. But the point is that from, and those a, from, are not in from, the public from a macroeconomic perspective your government's performance simply hasn't been good. I mean, the question is, what went wrong? And the against, answer against, is against a lack, we... hold on, the answer is a lack of decisive policies in terms of decisive policies in terms of the variables that okay. affect the Nigerian economy. Okay. You in may have started policy, turning the tide now, but that's go. what held the economy let back for a the, long let time. Let us go to the policies. And, and again, when you talk about time, uh, I have had the privilege of having served at subnational level, and I know how much teamwork it requires to even evolve a plan and also to ensure that it delivers. And the best analogy I can use, and which I often use, because I think Nigerians follow and love their football. Mm. We see clubs buy new players, and in one season or two seasons, sometimes it doesn't translate to victory. We are ready to make that explanation and defense how oh, the players have just come they don't they haven't yet gelled right. they haven't yet understood themselves ministers of government heads of protesters parliamentarians are no different from a football team they are a team in government and some of them are just coming in they've never worked in government before some of them have never worked at federal level before it requires time for everybody to understand what everybody feels and consult because if you don't have that team rolling government is a very slow burning so why did you government give us the impression you were going to come in and bring change we dramatic were going to bring change, change. nobody the told you change was, was going to happen overnight no, no, no. You, anybody would let gave. me make this point anybody yeah. who does not know that government is a very slow burning but deliberate fire and that because of its size, it is a behemoth that takes some time to start. Nigeria and is when, the it gathers, in the when it gathers momentum, it is unstoppable. As I've said to people, we have momentum, we're unstoppable, we will deliver on what we have committed to. The signs and the, and the, and, and the macro indicators are already heading in the right direction. What I'm trying to get you to see is the fact that you are trying to get me to see devils i don't see <laughs> devils i see angels i don't see devils i <laughs> i see facts what i'm trying to get you to focus on is the fact that you came into office okay yes all these points you make may well be 
They are. They, they no, are not no, no, They on. are. They may well they be. They are, Charles. I am, I am here Admit to, it. They I are. Here you to know it. I represent the Nigerian people. I represent the Nigerian people the too. Pinch. And, and the point is this, that when you came into office, as you were trying to block all those leakages, okay, and corruption is another question, of course, while you were trying to block all those leakages, while you were trying to get your head around what you needed to do to rescue the economy, there should have been, and all economists will say this to you, not lawyers, economists, there should have been a corresponding and immediate injection of spending into the economy. So the delay in spending coinciding with the constriction of economic activity led to a sharp downturn, a slowdown, which in turn led to negative growth. And what that underscores is that President Buhari and his the team he came in with had no understanding of how to deal no, with an me, economy let such me, as let, Nigeria. Let me, let me answer you very quickly. At the time this government came in, you and I will record, and your records will show that the oil prices had drastically tumbled. That was 90% of Nigeria's revenue source. So agri hadn't even kicked in. Taxes were not really being administered the way they are now. So where was the money that was going well, to be spent? Actually, Excuse me, let, let me, me make let this me point. Where was, a point. Where was the money that let, was going let, to be let spent? Let me correct a point what? there, because the figures... It's not nine, it wasn't ninety percent, it was about seventy percent. Seventy five percent. Seventy five percent and yes. not only but but seventy five percent of raw hard currency. Let, let us make the but, point for that. But, let me finish but now. I fifteen percent of GDP. I take the point. So look that's listen, why I keep talking the point, about the one hundred trillion naira that point, you were not you, the you point simply weren't handling make, it properly. The point to them make is that if your major source of revenue as a family head has dropped mm. and you had states where workers were not being paid salaries. What do you do? And that was a period the government was even trying to stabilize, to avert a labor crisis, trying to help state governors to say, take, go and help, just go and pay people first, while we are evolving our infrastructure and, and, and diversification plan into mining, into a Greek, and infrastructure renewal, and so on and so forth. Those are the realities. No president comes in with cash. Not even Donald Trump can fund the American government. And you see all of the processes it takes to even agree. In that economy, too, they can't agree on some major issues. Right. And it takes time to build consensus. That is the price of freedom, because it's a government that must be built upon consensus and agreement. Every constituent and constituency matters. And everybody stands on his own record of election and says, this is what my people want. Now, we need to make hard choices. Can you come with me on this while this wait? And that is the allusion to teamwork. It must take time. Some people want to play attacking football. Coach wants defensive football. And there must be a time where they can hit a compromise in the middle. Minister, I'm going to ask you to pause to catch your breath once again. My breath is um, intact as usual. <laughs> uh, you're watching Nigeria, The Road to 2019. We'll be back in a moment to continue our conversation with the Minister of Power, Works and Housing and former Lagos State Governor Babatunde Raji Fashola. Stay with us. Welcome back to Nigeria, the road to 2019. I'm Charles Nyekul, and we're having a chat with the Minister of Power, Works and Housing and former Lagos State Governor Babatunde Raji Fashola. Thank you very much indeed for staying with us. Um, let's talk about um, the facts that seem to be in your government's favor. Um, and that is on how you've dealt with the security problems in the Northeast, where Boko Haram used to be entrenched in 14 local governments, and today they've lost control of all that territory. But another resurgent military threat is looming, an equally horrific, deadly conflict, which is essentially putting President Buhari's security pledges to the test before the elections and that's the herder farmer clashes in the central belt what i mean without prejudice minister 
what are the conflict resolution mechanisms that you've put in place there? And how are you reforming, for instance, livestock management practices, addressing negative environmental trends and curbing cross-border movements of both cattle rustlers and armed head herders, which are all contributing to this conflict? I think that uh, my colleagues in the ministries of justice who are in charge of uh, administration of justice, law enforcement, interior, and defense will be better suited with facts and figures to respond to detailed issues. Uh, but i like to make some interventions uh, around the issues you've raised, conflict management, dispute resolution, uh, uh, peace management mm. will be the a uh, significant dilemma that confront uh, leaders across the world from sub-national to, to national level and international level. And, but the point I want to make first, and contrary to some of the things that have come up, people talk about deploying soldiers, deploying policemen. The truth is that soldiers and policemen are law enforcement agents. All they will come and do is prevent people from breaching the peace. Don't fight. Don't arm, engage in armed conflict. Their job is not to bring peace. Their job is to enforce the law. The people themselves must want to live in peace. So it's like going into a home, husband and wife are bad them, and they are determined not to live in peace. For as long as you stay there, you will maintain some peace or some order. When you leave, they start tearing at each other. The point I'm making therefore is that all of us have a collective interest in ensuring that we build peace. The Mechanics for doing that, the institutional, traditional, religious, local, governmental, communal, and all of that, we must evoke them. That's in the long term. Now, now in, the immediate in the immediate term, term, as we see people being killed, the, in the allegation term, is that your government has not stepped up to the plate with enough defenses. You're, you me, are charged as me, the chief security officer of me, this country. Let me, let me say to you that our government does not govern across all of the states. And state governments and local government officers also have an important role to play in ensuring peaceful coexistence. Because really and truly, now we are in a studio, if you had breaking news every minute of the day, you would not be able to cope. And by analogy, if you had conflict that frequently, how many people can you really deploy? So at the end of the day, the first thing we must do in order to achieve this is that people must resolve to live in peace. Crime and conflicts are dynamic. A few years ago, Many, 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 almost one and a half, two decades ago, it was Aguleri, Umulere who were fighting. It was Ife, Mudakeke, it was uh, my 12 and ethnic clashes in Lagos. And th these things are dynamic. At one time, it was armed robbers everywhere. It has changed to kidnapping. Today, somebody was, people were shot in Toronto, Canada. I saw that on your news. Uh, people have died on the West Bank of well, Gaza. Well, that's no consolation to the people no, no, in the not, middle I'm not, belt, I'm not seeking to console anybody. Right. It's a matter for regret. Every life that we lose. And don't misunderstand me. And I'm not suggesting that it is consolation. And I've made the point that these are the biggest challenges of the world now in trying right. to... But I think the most important news that I have heard is that the farmers and the cattle rearers have decided to work together. And I saw that in one editorial a couple of days ago. And I think that's the first big step towards solving this problem. I don't think the farmers hate the headsmen, and I don't think the headsmen hate the farmers. As I say to people, uh, the herdsman will eat grains and millet, and the farmer will eat beef. But they are pushed to the extremes of survival because cattle needs about 50 liters of water a day. The sources of water are shrinking. There are major sources of conflict across the world. And we must first find peace, right. how to work together, how to live together, so that everybody can survive together. Let me, and let me I, ask and, you And this. I think that, that's the point to make. Right. And in terms, of, in terms of the point I made, that people voted for this government and for every government for different reasons. I've spoken about roads and all of that. The people who voted us in at the time, the major item on their agenda then was how to stop the Boko Haram. Conflict. And that I said, was one and, of and, the, and, yeah, the, the major item, I did the service. I was part of the team who did this. So that was the biggest item of security. We had lost local government. People have returned to those local governments. We met the cheaper girls, about 200 and something of them. We recovered some of them. We moved that needle forward. We suffered the lapse on the, on the Dapshi girls, but again, we recovered them. 
And now what we're dealing with are symmetric wars largely. And these are not unique. They've happened in, in England during the Irish crisis. They've happened in Israel in the 70s. They take time. It requires intelligence, and there's nothing esoteric about intelligence. Right, okay. Intelligence is you and I we have to move sharing on. information to sure. law enforcement so that we can first prevent conflict from happening, and if possible, if it happens, regrettably, we can apprehend those and bring them to justice. Now, let, let's just talk about trust and the deficit of it. When you were governor of Lagos State, probably virtually every Nigerian, I wouldn't say all Nigerians because you know, I don't have that statistic, but most Nigerians were appreciative of your efforts. And Nigerians are not generally in that sense, they don't hold back when they see someone with a good track record. You had a good track record in Lagos State. You delivered. And I talk to taxi drivers, I talk to businessmen, I talk to all kinds of people. And to a man and woman, they all commended your work in Lagos. But there seems to be a complete reversal with this particular government. The, 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 a lot of people, I mean, and I'm wondering how concerned are you that the rhetoric, in spite of your rhetoric and all the valiant defences that you're attempting this to is no put up, no rhetoric or valiant defence. No, 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 all I, what I've well, said is it's, verifiable. It's a valiant defence. What they're, I'm saying they're, is that they're verifiable. They are the facts. The, the trust of the people, which was the biggest credit to President Buhari when he came to power, and where there was absolutely no wavering in the minds of majority of Nigerians at all, who trusted him absolutely solid that he has failed to manage that public goodwill and the growing sense appears to be that the change you promised was a slogan not a program thank you are you uh, now i can respond i think first the first thing to say is that when i was governor nobody gave me the impression that they loved me that much they held my they feet. didn't have to love they, they, they left they held my feet to fire Till the end of the day, they didn't have not, to love not the least this 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 medium, and so the point I'm trying to make is that perhaps when President Buhari is ultimately finished, hopefully in 2023, all of the Nigerian people hopefully. will come round in full circle to say this really was a good steward and servant for our country. But the point to make is that I can't remember one federal government, one tenure federal government, where the honeymoon lasted more than two years. I can't remember one in my cognitive and adult life. And it is only when they have left that we actually give them credit for what they did. Every one of them never pleased us. So I think we should stand back a little right, okay. and really see whether indeed some of the challenges that we place at the door of the federal government ought to be placed at another level of government. And, and so, but the point also to make is that, look, when, and, and it's interesting that this is happening, Barack Obama campaigned on the on this mantra and slogan of change and people i was talking to as he was facing re-election said look we the blacks who voted for him don't see what this change is but you know what happened when he was leaving the blacks who were talking to me who i even persuaded to stay with him that i think that it takes time to turn things around were saying they were sad to leave him go and i i, I don't see that there'll be too much difference this is what happens once you start governing once you start implementing policies your policies will affect people and so if a policy, for example, like TSA, brings back all the money that was freely flowing, those who lose control of that kind of money can't like you. If a policy that spends more on infrastructure and less on recurrent, those who are beneficiaries of that, so you begin to make enemies while you start, once you start governing. Your job, and those of us who serve with you, is to continue as we do to explain that it will be better because you will see the results of this investment right. as we go. There is no success story, not one, that hasn't been built on a foundation of adversity. The adversity has come, the road to success is clear, we have momentum towards it, and we will deliver. Okay. Um, Babatunde uh, Raji Fashola, I would have loved to talk to you about a lot of other things. You're absolutely fascinating to listen to and to watch. I wanted to talk to you about the Apapa gridlock. I wanted to talk to you about the, the coalition that you helped form in the APC and whether it is in fact falling apart. But unfortunately, we're out of time. But, but I want to thank you exceedingly for coming in today. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for having me.
Well, that's it for this edition, or rather extended edition, of Nigeria, the road to 2019. Join us again for a fresh edition tomorrow. From me and the entire team here in Abuja, bye-bye and thank you for watching.